This is Roy Samuelson, founder, creator, and host of the ADNA Presents. We've been enlightening audiences and entertainment decision makers of the nuance and expertise of audio description professionals, over 100 of them so far on this podcast, through these interviews, which platform talents of all kinds in audio description. The ADNA Presents is a podcast, which you're listening to right now, and volume one is now available on Kindle under the ADNA Presents Know Your Narrator and the ADNA Credit Lists, which you can go to theadna.org to find your favorite titles and voice talents and writers and engineers and quality control people. All credits are available there when audiences publicly contribute them. So uh, please check out the website and here's a throwback to another The ADNA Presents back when it was called Know Your Narrator. Enjoy. Welcome to the Audio Description Narrators of America Know Your Narrator series bonus episode. Today we're very pleased and honored to have both Satana Howery and Chris Snyder in a panel discussion about not necessarily audio description, but uh, entertainment access as far as voice talents are concerned. I'm William Chip Beeman, CEO of Nighthawk Digital Entertainment Group, and you're listening to the Audio Description Narrators of America Know Your Narrator series Beyond Your Narrator episode. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Indeed. Satana, thank you for being here. And Chris, thank you for being here. Satana, let's start with you. I'd love to, to start by asking you a question about your experience with accessibility as far as being a, a talent goes. Can you give maybe a, a brief overview or maybe a specific instance that comes to mind? I think for me, I primarily work out of my home studio. So I have a lot of flexibility in working with my clients and most of them don't know that I can't see unless they've Googled me. It's not an intentional hiding of it. It's just not a disclosure of it either because most of the time there's no reason to disclose it. They've listened to my voice, they've selected me. And so I just go and do the work. Thanks, Satana. How about you, Chris? Well, as far as access, uh, as Satana said, I don't, I don't disclose unless it is necessary. Thankfully, particularly in, in the world we find ourselves now where people are, are basically doing everything either from their home studio or, or just essentially online, it, it's no longer a question of asking for electronic copies of scripts or anything like that. They're there. So it doesn't become as much of an issue. What I do find uh, sometimes a barrier is on certain sites where you are meant to send your auditions, perhaps the website itself isn't terribly accessible. The buttons aren't labeled. The graphics aren't labeled. There's no, you know, you know sometimes you run into situations like that or where, you know, clicking on the button with your preferred screen reader doesn't actually activate the button to upload something. So then you're like, oh, okay, well, I got to get somebody else to click this for me. Um, in which case, you know, you can, you can use services like Ira, or if you have a, a site link, as I like to call them handy, you just ask them to click it. <laughs> but that's, that's really, as far as being a VO artist, that's, that's been the only potential barrier that I've seen. But I think it's a really strong barrier. I mean, I, I would, if I can piggyback on this, I completely agree. And one of the things that's happening with these online platforms is that over the past couple of years, they have changed significantly from what they were when I started out uh, in 2013. And, and some of them are still continuing to sort of retool and redesign. And they're doing that redesign without consideration of blind voice talent or even blind voice seekers in mind. I mean, people go on to these sites to post these jobs and what's to stop somebody from being blind who's looking for a voice artist? So I, I, think, I think it's a concern. And I also think that there are other pieces of software out there that don't lend themselves out of the box to accessibility. The one that jumps out for me that everybody wants and loves and that I've used since I began in 2013 is Source Connect. Uh, it's gotten better. Under NVDA, there's a lot of information that is just there and noticeable. And the uh, VOCR in Windows does a pretty good job of managing the stuff that the screen reader doesn't automatically see. But th there's nothing on the side of the developer that's been done to actually improve or create 
that kind of space. I think a lot of the improvement there has been on the screen reader side. Yeah, I would have to say I agree with that. Um, the and just for those who don't know, NVDA is a, stands for Non Visual Desktop Access, which is a, a free screen reader that can be downloaded for the Windows environment. I haven't had a chance to play with Source Connect on a Mac, but I would imagine it's similar. However, Apple has recently come out with a a thing they're calling, oh gosh, what is it? Um, screen recognition. Yeah, I call screen it, recognition that's on the iPhone. Yeah, in, in like if, iOS fourteen. Yeah, right. And if they and if they are to if that's to come to Mac, which I would imagine that it is, that could serve a similar function as as VoCR in the Windows environment. So, oh, well, I, and the, there is VoCR on the Mac too, right? There's VoCR that you can download from GitHub. Uh, uh, Chi Kim is involved in that from Berkeley School of Music and. Uh, I, I know it works pretty well in Catalina. See, this is this is info I didn't have. This is good. Oh, yeah. That's another thing. You know, maybe it's time for blind artists, uh, VO artists, and and engineers to get together and have a, a environment to wade through some of this stuff. But Satana is right. The developers could. It's not hard to alt tag your buttons. It's not hard to label your buttons. It's a matter of a few moments. I am reminded of a story that Rick Boggs told me about making Pro Tools accessible back in the day where they came in, they decided, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to make it work with um, Mac OS X and it's going to be great. And they anticipated a huge challenge. But Slough Hallitton, who is a blind audio engineer, um, very accomplished studio producer, went to the folks at, I think it was Digit Design still back then, not Avid, and said, this is what's not labeled. This is what's happening. And the engineer, they assigned him an engineer to work with him. And within one day, they had like essentially 80% of, the, of Pro Tools accessible. So it proves to me, and that's that program is huge. And all you had to do was go in there and label elements and fix it, you know, make make sure that they were clickable. And it's like, if Pro Tools can do that in a day, why are we having this conversation still in 2020? Why aren't people just going by the guidelines established by the Windows world and the Mac world as to how to make your program accessible? That's that's where I'm at with with that. I think I I feel conflicted about this. Like on the one hand, I understand the point. And on the other side, it's more than just labeling buttons, right? I mean, it's creating a workflow and it's creating keyboard shortcuts, which in Pro Tools, there are lots of them. But mm -hmm. still, Slough and Chi Kim and Rocco, and I can't remember Rocco's last name. <laughs> Rocco was like the document guy. <laughs> and they came in and they wrote this add-on to Pro Tools called Flow Tools. Now, you can take Pro Tools right out of the box and you can use it right out of the box and it works. But when you add Flow Tools in, there are all of these additional keyboard commands that make your workflow cleaner. And there mm -hmm. are things you can do where if you have a control surface, when you insert a plug-in onto a track, you can literally turn the knobs on the control surface and you can hear the numerical value of the parameter that you're changing rather than just listening to what that parameter does. You can hear, you know, where it is. And all of these workflow things that came into being little things like when your track is armed, there's a little beep. And when it's unarmed, there's a doo -doo, like a double beep. Just all of these workflow things that sighted people, I think, would take for granted that that uh, Slough and, and Chi and Rocco created and that they still create. Now, I want to I want to point this out and I point this out because, A, it's bigger than just labeling buttons. But B, when they created Flow Tools, what they also did was they gave it to the community. It, there's no charge for Flow Tools. Anybody can go get it. It is supposed to set up uh, itself in a way that when you turn the screen reader on the Mac, when you toggle it on using the command F5 key, Flow Tools comes on. And when you toggle it off, Flow Tools turns off. It's like I said, it's free. It's available to the blindness community at large. If you look at something, if you compare that to something like Source Connect, there's a guy who's gone out and he has paid someone to create scripts to use for Source Connect with JAWS 
Jaws is a screen reader under Windows. It's a paid screen reader under Windows. And boy, do you pay. Um, not so much anymore. You can get a license. I think it's like, uh, I don't remember if it's 150 or if it's 99 a year or something. They've, they've, they've changed how the home licenses are done. Um, so yes, it used to be like 800, a thousand bucks just for the screen reader. It's, it's significantly cheaper than that these days. But the point is you have to pay for the screen reader. Then you're paying for Source Connect, the license. You've had to pay for the Windows operating system. Now, in addition, you've gone and you've paid for somebody to make JAWS work with Source Connect. And it only works for that particular version until they update JAWS or until Windows changes or until Source Connect changes. It's a workaround that doesn't work so well if something changes. And without the developer coming in and actively participating in the accessibility process, it's, it's a kludgy workaround. The beautiful thing about Flow Tools is even if Flow Tools blows up tomorrow, you can just turn it off and yeah. still use Pro Tools, like I said, out of the box. So I just want to acknowledge Avid's commitment to accessibility outside of somebody else coming in. And I, and I also want to point out that the JAWS scripts that were made for Source Connect are for one person. He's not giving them to the blindness community. He's not handing them out. He, he had them made for him. And Source Connect, the, 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 it's, it's just such a valuable, useful piece of software. And it's way, way, way teeny, teeny, tinier than Pro Tools. Yeah, I want to make an analogy for people. Paid screen readers and paid apps, uh, paid accessibility. I think that's a good term. Paid accessibility is like you buy a brand new car and then you have to pay extra for the keys. That's what it's like. You've bought this brand new car. It's great. It's got all the bells and whistles. You love it. But in order to start it, you have to buy a key on top of buying the car. And that bugs me just on, on a visceral level. <laughs> As a blind person, I, I feel like we should be afforded the same opportunities, the same access when possible without having to pay a surcharge, I, the blind tax. It's a blind tax. That's just my opinion, but. <laughs> Let me jump in by taking that analogy of the, the keys that you have to pay for and apply that to something else that both of you have implied as far as the barriers go. We've discussed the technology and the you know, additional costs, the, the blind tax. I'm curious if all of these things also relate to beyond the technology, the culture, that there, there seems to be a, a, a subtext here that there are people that are creating technology in the entertainment industry who hire blind talent or who hire talent that are not aware that there's, a, there's an education that's, that's needed to be included here. Could either of you address that, Satana? I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, working from home, part of what I love about this industry is that I don't have to say it. I get to choose, and that provides a certain level of control. I can kind of control that shock and awe value. Every now and then I'll get someone who will contact me and they'll say, hey, you know, I Googled you and I noticed that you're blind. Is there anything I can do to make this easier for you? What can I do? And <laughs> wow, you know, that's exciting. So it's a tough one. Do I, like I said, I don't hide it. So if you looked at my social media, if you Googled me, you would see it. But it's, I don't directly state it. Um, in terms of the education of it, though, I also just don't think that sighted people are aware of the impact. I, I went to a, a voiceover conference recently where I had pointed out that I couldn't see. And somebody asked me, well, how does that affect you as a voice actor? Like, people have no idea. Mm -hmm. And yet... So you get some people that will ask that question, but much of the time you just get, well, how do you manage to, how do you read your scripts? Oh, you must do really, you must be memorizing. You must do short scripts and, and you just have to memorize them, right? Or you get the myth of, and this one particularly, I think is a concern uh, for more than voice talent. It's a broader concern for engineers. You get the myth of, you have to have your own environment. It must work well for you because you're in your own space and you've set it up to work for you. So this idea that if you were to come into my studio, the accommodations I would have to make might just be too difficult. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're in your own space, it's perfectly okay. And I know Chris can speak to that as well. <laughs> yeah, there's, I, I'm, I'm in the position of being both an engineer and a VO artist. And uh, I find that it's much more on the engineering side, much more on the, the, the behind the scenes, the post-production side of things, whether that's audiobooks or dramas or post-production for TV or whatever it is, there is absolutely a, a white cane lattice ceiling, for lack of a better term, <laughs> that is a barrier to us, to, to blind people, to blind uh, audio professionals. And a lot of that has to do with allowing us near their precious thousands, multi-thousands dollar technology without understanding how it is that we use it. And nowadays, especially, you know, back in the early aughts, there was Outspoken, which was an add-on screen reader for Apple that you had to install on the computer. Nowadays, of course, it's all built in from the get-go. We don't have to do anything. We can literally just hit Command F5, turn on voiceover on any Apple computer, and voila, there you go. Um, as Satana said, Flow Tools does make things easier, but it's not required. So I can, I can literally work in any studio that has Pro Tools and several that don't for that matter, because there are accessibility options available for other things. But a lot of the people who do the hiring aren't going to see that. They're going to see a guy walk in with his guide dog and go, holy crap, are you kidding me? You can't do this. I actually had somebody speak with me on the phone. I was interviewing for a job as an audiobook editor and that person was very gung ho about my resume and said, "Oh my gosh, this is so impressive! Can we can we meet? Let's let's get started." And I said, "Great. May I have an electronic copy of the script we're going to be using?" And they said, "Why?" And I said, "Because I'm going to need to be able to read it off my Braille display." <laughs> and the next words out of their mouth were, "Oh no, this is impossible. You can't possibly do this job." Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a two time award winner for producing audio dramas and I've produced thousands of hours of audio for television and film and you're going to sit there and tell me I can't possibly edit and produce the audiobook you're doing and it's that frustration of not even the question of huh how are you going to do this no it's the it's assumption a, you can't yeah that's just this automatic closing of the box <laughs> and and for me if I had been in, I think this 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 comes up to, I, I've, I've said multiple times, I don't hide my blindness, but I will say that there are instances where people will ask me questions and I, and I do feel a little bit like I'm dodging. Because <laughs> like in Chris's scenario, I would have said something like, oh, well, you know, I like to have my script up on the screen. It's just my workflow, you know? And it's true. So my screen isn't a monitor. There are plenty of, of voice talent who put their DAW, their digital audio workstation, the thing they're using to record, they put that up on one side, they put the, uh, the script up on the other side and they just mouse between the two, you know, because screens are big enough. Hey, man, I mean, we, we could be so cool that we could even have two screens connected to the computer at the same time. <laughs> uh, my husband's an IT guy and he talks, about, uh, he talks about this, that the people who are coming back into the office are not allowed more than two screens. <laughs> it's like it's, okay two screens wow <laughs> it's true it's true we had an we had a guy in audio who who wanted his he had he really wanted two screens to work from and so we had to set up a, a station for him that has a screen which contained his scripts and then the other one that had pro tools on it yeah so it's a really doable thing but i find that i would have said something like that to try and control the shock and awe I wouldn't have told them over the phone. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that what Chris did was wrong. I'm suggesting that there's this sort of space where I think as a blind person, I have to think about how I'm going to sort of control that shock and awe or what I'm going to do to accommodate the situation. It, it ends up falling to me to make the sighted person feel at ease. Whether it should or shouldn't, the reality is it ends up landing on my plate. And so my feeling is to do that, I have to try and find ways to control it until I think they can handle it. <laughs> and I think so I would have done that. I think, I think maybe I could have at least gotten in the door and, yeah. and then they would have had to see me come in with my guide and then maybe mm -hmm. they would have had a little freak out. But at least 
you know, I was there and it would be harder to make me leave. Yes. Right? And I could have, and, and I think the reason I didn't react that way. And I, upon hearing that, I wish I had, but it's that the interview had gone so well. Yeah. It was really like, we seemed to be getting on well and, and things were proceeding apace and, and there were no weird vibes. And I, and I, I misjudged the person. I thought that they were capable of, of dealing with it and they weren't. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the, of the point here is that I've done that too, where I feel like it's going really well and I feel like I can say something and it's always sort of a. It's Russian roulette. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I went, back when I first started this job, I had a client who uh, wanted me to do uh, several hours of e-learning that were financial scripts. And they, ha- they were hiring multiple talent for this. And they had sent all of the other talent they had hired binders with all of the charts and graphs that they didn't want the talent to read just crossed out. And they were ready to send me a binder. <laughs> I had to say, well, that's not going to work. And uh, they got it. So what they ended up doing was both. They sent me the PDF electronic versions, but they also still sent me the binder. And that way I was able to sit with my husband and I'm looking at my PDF and I'm sitting with him and he's got the binder. And I said, okay, this sentence ends here. And then I think that there's something that looks like it might be some kind of sidebar am I supposed to read that and so he kind of helped me work through that and we did it together so I mean there are always ways around it too and I think one of the things that uh, blind people coming into this need to know is you need to know what your needs are and you need to be able to effectively articulate them this is not a, a some kind of ADA accommodated government sponsored 508, you know, nobody's going to pay for your braille display or whatever. So, so on the other side of it is I do think that you, you have to know yourself and, and what you use and what you can manage. And I think one of the other things that, that happens for sighted people is they meet one blind person who may not have those answers and thus they assume everybody else must be the same way. And that's where you get phrases like uncommonly fast Braille reader because they ran into somebody who wasn't. <laughs> and so it must be uncommon for, for those that are, or it must be difficult, or maybe your Braille displays too. I mean, I've heard blind people talk about maybe your Braille displays too loud. And I, I've never had this issue. Even in orbit someday. in front of a U87, I've never had this issue. Well... <laughs> <laughs> if you have an orbit, an orbit is this little 20 or 40 cell display and it's uh, the cells are mechanical. So they make a, they do definitely make a noise, but most Braille displays are piezoelectric and they don't make nearly as much noise. You might hear the press of a button as I'm switching from one line to another, but generally speaking, there's not a lot of ruckus that goes on with a Braille display. It's not like listening Indeed. to a Braille uh, printer, a Braille embosser. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> they actually, oh, those they are really actually the Braille, the Braille embossers. Most of them actually have literally got acoustical they baffling yes. around them because they are so loud. They have their own booths. <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> They do. It's a giant thing with foam around them. It's. <laughs> it's uh. This is such a great conversation. I'm curious about a dream world scenario, either culturally or technologically. That, Satana, let's start with you. That it just would just would make this work better. A big piece of my dream world scenario is. A couple of things. A, that developers consider accessibility uh, from the ground up. Um, Roy, I noticed your latest email to me came from hey.com. And I believe hey is also, they're the makers of Basecamp. Is that right? Uh-huh. And so they have an actual accessibility statement on their website. They acknowledge the web accessibility guidelines. They have clearly written out what they are doing thus far, what they plan to do in the future. They recognize it's not perfect and they're working on it. They also recognize the value of creating things that are easy navigationally, but also adding in keyboard shortcuts. Like they've written all this stuff out. It's so cool. 
Uh, so, you know, in my dream world, the, the accessibility is created from the ground up. And I can tell you when it's not, it is so much harder to go back in and add it and rethink it. And then the other piece of my dream world is I, I want the services that, that involve people who are blind or affect people who are blind to actually hire people who are blind. I want more blind people doing audio description, voicing it, quality checking it, you know, being involved in that process and, and more companies acknowledging that, yes, we can. And yes, they should and we should. Beyond that, I, I just want people to ask the questions. I think that there's a there's this thing that the ADA has created. We're 30 years in. We still have huge unemployment rates. We're 30 years in. And uh, there's this thing where when you go on a job interview, you technically, you can't ask a person with a disability how they're going to do the job. <laughs> but they do all the time. But they do. But on the, the, on the other hand, I feel like if I can't put you at ease about how I'm going to do it and you can't imagine it, we're at an impasse, you know? So I, it's a struggle. Uh, and I think it, that's sort of a balance that everybody faces, regardless of what industry you're in is, you know, wh when do you say it? What do you say? How do you do it? And how do you straddle that line? I think that the conversation has to happen. It does because you brought that up specifically. I'll, I'll relate a small uh, thing that happened when I was uh, looking for a position um, I applied at a, a place that made industrial videos and I applied because they wanted an audio engineer, a Pro Tools audio engineer in particular. And I walked in there with my guide and <laughs> that guy was very polite and he was like, oh, uh, and he, but you could tell it was really awkward for him. And I said, well, I said, let's just, let's just deal with the elephant in the room i said ask me any questions you like i'm here to try to put you yeah. in a position where you feel comfortable about hiring me and so he asked me like how i would do the work and i explained about the screen reader and pro tools and blah 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 and and he said well that's that's great he said but we use you know we you know, it's funny because he said we use the c24 it's a it's a big console with a lot of buttons i mean how do you know what buttons what and i said well <laughs> it happens that i i actually use the c24 uh for my other job and uh, for the job i had before so i'm very familiar with it and and um uh, you know, I know its capabilities quite well. So, you know, and he said, well, well, I, I mean, I just don't know. I mean, he was so flustered. And I said, look, and at this point, I had been without a job for several years. And I said, out of desperation, I will work for you for free for 30 days. And if at the end of that time, you don't feel like I am equal to the task and can and can do the job that you need me to do, then I'll go away and you'll never hear from me again. And you'll have gotten 30 days of free work. And he said, well, we'll be in touch. And he wasn't in touch and he wasn't in touch. And, and then I call him finally. And I said, what's, I said, uh, what, you know, what's happening? And he said, well, we decided to rehire the guy we fired. And I thought that was odd. And I look in the the place where the the ad was in the first place, and the ads back up looking for a Pro Tools audio engineer. So wow. there are some people who just can't conceive of it. There there are people who simply, even if you try to, even if you do all the right things, even if you go out of your way and you <laughs> violate the spirit of the ADA and and tell them how you can do the job and all of this, they there are some people in this industry i suspect in every industry who they just can't wrap their head around it no matter how you try to help them and that's unfortunate so in my dream world i would like to see more open minds and uh, <laughs> hey it's a dream world so i'd like to see more open minds i'd like to see people from their perspective, take a chance and, and let us do the work. You know, I, I, it's, I agree with Satana about the technology, but we can have the best technology in the world and the most accessible stuff we can have. And when the people, but if the, if the sighted folks that are doing the hiring aren't behind us, if they're not willing to let us do the work or, or consider us professionals 
in our own right, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really make as big a difference as it could. We can do all of the work on our own as we're doing right now, but we need them to get on board. One of the best feelings in the world for me was when I got my first non-description VO job uh, and non-audio drama VO job. And it, it, it so far has been my only animation job. I played a part on Handy Manny and they were specifically asking for blind actors to play this role of a blind teenager with a guide dog. And uh, it was remarkable to just walk in. I had my braille script. I was ready to go and I had it there and I had a wonderful welcoming experience. Got to meet some of the top talent in the industry. And it was just amazing and work with, with a wonderful director. And, and I just think, you know, God, why, why, can't, why can't it all be like this? <laughs> okay, I want to piggyback on so many things you said. <laughs> okay, so uh, your stint on, on uh, Handy Manny um, made me think about how many auditions I see that go by where they're doing e-learning, where they're going to teach their employees about diversity and inclusion with people with disabilities <laughs> or organizations that, that um, help people with disabilities. But there is nothing in those auditions saying people with disabilities given preference to actually do this work. You know, we're, we're into this place in 2020 with Black Lives Matter, where we're having bigger, more open conversations about this and about how casting works or doesn't work. And I think it's harder with people with disabilities because there's a whole bunch of, first of all, there's a whole bunch of intersectionality, right? Like you can be a black LGBTQ, you know, blind person. So there's all that intersectionality, but I just think that there's a lot of organizations who work with people with disabilities that don't actively seek to hire them, don't tell their third party production houses or whomever is gonna go hire that talent to say anything about it in the auditions. And that frustrates me. Uh, certification, you were talking, Chris, about sighted people who are just not willing to give it a chance, even when we wanna give them everything for free, right? There have been efforts recently to create a certification exam for audio description, and they've try, they're trying to set it up so that blind people can take this exam and, and that kind of thing to be uh, certified. And with this idea that, you know, if we certify people, it's going to be great, you know, and blind people will be certified too. Yeah, there are plenty of blind people with college degrees and, you know, higher education that still have trouble getting hired. It's not about the certification. I'm not saying this, that, that, that the certification ideas are uh, terrible and that creating guidelines is a bad idea. I'm just saying that in the short term, it's not going to change the outcome for blind people who want to be employed do doing audio description. It's not going to change anything. It's going to be a long time before that happens. And then the other thing is, Roy, you and I were in a, a conversation a, a couple weeks ago and I forget exactly what you said, and I'll let the story be yours, actually. But something popped out at me, which was that there was a sighted person who was talking to you about how blind people do their work, what's the process, how would it work kind of thing, what needed to happen. And um, this idea that we need sighted allies because sighted people talking to other sighted people allow those other sighted people to be curious. Whereas if I talk to a sighted person, the fact that that sighted person doesn't know the answer makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I'd love to ask both of you is, it's a perfect transition, what sighted allies can do. But to address that, Shatana, I wish we would have recorded that conversation. <laughs> that would have been- It was, own. it was pretty great, right? <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> One of the things that really strikes me about these conversations is the nuance. There are so many aspects of accessibility. Chris, earlier you said you said about uh, taking a chance, but I'd love to to see our our culture get to the point where it's not taking a chance. It's just a given. It's not tokenism that it's legitimate professional services being provided by legitimate sure. professionals. And to bridge that gap, I'm curious. You know, especially with our audience, we've got blind talents, we've got blind audience members, we've got sighted allies, we've got people who love audio description, 
who use it for for cooking or driving or you know they're tired of staring at zoom screens all day with their eyes and they just want to enjoy an audio drama and so there's there's a lot of aspects to audio description for all and as a, a sighted ally it's not your job to tell me what to do but i'm curious if we could give you that you know this this uh this microphone where where you see us cited allies speaking up. And I think, Satana, one of the things that I'm finding is that with each engagement that you and I have, or that I have with any blind talents or, or blind audience members, that I as a, uh, as a person am growing and I'm becoming better. As a, as a talent, I'm becoming better. And these are, these are selfish benefits. I'm not doing it for that, but that's like a nice side effect. So it seems like this is such an easy win, 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 and not um, as big of a hurdle as, as some sighted people make it out to be. What can sighted allies do that we're not doing now? My initial impulse is to say, when you have the chance to promote us, in other words, if, if you don't feel like, I, I understand there's, there's some competition among us because we're all VO talents, but when you, if you don't feel like you're right for the role or you think that a blind colleague of yours is right for the role, say, hey, you know, um, I don't think I'm, I'm right for this, but check this out and send them the demo. Or say, um, you know, I have a friend who I think would be really great for this. Mm, can I give them your contact info? Or, or can I give you their contact info? Or, uh, but, but, you know, I, I'm afraid that it has to be that blatant right now. That's, I, I know that sounds really crass in some ways, but I really think that until we get to the point where they consider us without being prompted, and by they, I mean casting the folks that decide on who does what, uh, the casting directors and, and or, or, or the e-learning uh, assignment makers, whatever, we're going to need to push them by having sighted allies kind of drop us in their lap. I mean, or at least, you know, even if you don't want to go that route, uh, say, hey, there's an audition for this particular role. I think you'd be great for it. Things like that. Um, I also think that if you are asked a question and you don't know the answer, don't just say, I don't know, but also maybe say, uh, let me check in. Let me check in with my friend. I'll get back to you about that. That's, that's a good question. I think it's easier for sighted allies to point out the inequities. If, if I write to this previous voice conference that I went to, and I did, I called them on it in the middle of their diversity panel. And I said, you know, there's nobody up here with a person with a disability on this panel. What's that about? And I, I got a, a, a verbal response around that. But clearly as a person with a disability, I've got the agenda to have somebody with a disability up there. So of course, I'm the one who's gonna say it. It's almost more effective when it comes from a, a sighted ally, I think. And again, I think that goes back to the discomfort people have, oh my gosh, the oversight, whoops, we goofed. That's really uncomfortable. It's way easier to say it to you than it is to say it to me. And I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. Of course, there's just the discomfort on the part of the sighted person for missing it. But there's also the frustration on my part that for me, I'm not a politician. I would be a terrible politician. I like doing political voiceover because I can be mad. <laughs> Attack ads are fun. No, <laughs> they are. But, um, but that frustration is, it's, it's just clear. It's clear and present for me and there's such a thing uh around oh it's it's a it is a great time to be blind right now in 2020 it is a fantastic time to be blind right i mean we have so much access as as, as many things as aren't accessible to us there are so so many things that are in so many fantastic ways that even five to ten years ago were not and we're just expected to have such gratitude around that. And I think we all do, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to raise the bar and keep growing and keep being more inclusive and integrative. I, I strongly believe there's a, there's a big difference between inclusion and integration. And it's that integrative space that, that I wanna get to. Like you were saying, uh, Roy, um, rather than taking a chance, it's just a given. 
I think we have a long way to go to get there. Something like this podcast is a great resource. And it's a great resource because honestly, it's being done by the sighted guy. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, yeah. if it's being done by the blind people, you know, okay, you attract the blind audience, but how do you engage sighted people in it beyond just the inspirational side of it? You can do that as a sighted person, I think, because again, it just goes back to that comfort level. Tolerance is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Hmm. Thanks for that. If we were to go back to what you said, Satana, about pointing out the inequities, and, and Chris, if we took it just one step back, I'm going to share my personal experience that my career is built on relationships and not necessarily relationships with those who make the decisions. Specifically, I've had opportunities to go to the dance, if I could use your metaphor, to go to these voiceover workouts where I met other voice talents. And you know, for decades, it's been doing these workouts week after week. And to your point, Satana, the, the technology has changed that now these workouts are virtual. And when I think about the opportunities that I've had, yeah, they have come through an agent or a, a casting director or a producer, but inevitably I'm going to look at at least seven out of 10 times that relationship came to me through another voice talent, that my opportunities came through voice talents who said, let me introduce you to my agent. Let me introduce you to this person who's doing this project. So to your point, Chris, let's take it one step back and ask, where do sighted allies engage with voice talents? And I think we started this conversation talking about a, a forum for that, whether it's on the technology side or, or on the, uh, the voice talent side, that this kind of engagement is essential for, for the culture the culture in the sense of uh, being able to develop a career is not based on simply doing a good audition. It's being at the right place at the right time with the right person to vouch for you. And that right person doesn't have to be a, a sighted person. I'm not suggesting uh, sighted people are gatekeepers. I'm suggesting that there is a culture of, of relationships here that can lead to that. And I, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by this conversation in general, but I'm, I'm curious about this particular aspect that it sounds like that could be a, uh, could be an angle. It certainly is. Um, I think anybody who's, who's been in this industry for any length of time understands that, that everything we do is, is with the exception of the audition sites and stuff like that, everything we do is relationship based. It, the entertainment industry itself is, is an, an ever-changing web of relationships. And I think we don't want necessarily the sighted people to be gatekeepers. The reality of the moment is that they are. And so, yes, to your point, having sighted people vouch for us and our talent is unfortunately often important. It's 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 an important uh, aspect of of getting into the the kind of major voiceover or or post production or or any aspect of this you know um, industry any part of that career path at this point I just I really think it is unfortunately one of those things that is until we break those barriers down it's going to be this way so. We just have to work with what we have at the moment and continually work to make it better. I think those relationships can be developed for sure, but I think it's only relevant to mention that the person you're referring is blind if you have to mention it. So if you're talking to someone who's doing a job for an organization that works with people with disabilities, then it might be worth saying, hey, I have this friend who would be great for this role and they happen to be blind. But if you're just talking about your run-of-the-mill voiceover gig or whatever, why does it matter? And in fact, I would argue that it doesn't. And that in some cases, what the sighted ally ends up doing is 
pushing the blindness as the first thing rather than pushing the talent as the first thing. And I don't even think people realize that they're doing it. But I've had people that I've met in person because before conferences were virtual, of course, they were in person. And it's the in-person thing. They get wowed. They see you reading your copy off of a Braille display and they want to introduce you to somebody else or they're talking to the, their friend about you. But the thing that they're bringing up to their friend isn't your great voiceover ability. It's the fact that you can't see. When yeah. it's that's not the reason you should necessarily get the role. And in some cases, depending upon who your friend is, that's going to pigeonhole you. Just because I'm blind doesn't mean that the only thing I want to do is to work with organizations that work with people with for, with disabilities or, you know, read audiobooks by blind authors or, you know, that kind of thing. Do audio description. So I think that 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 sometimes it can become front and center when it doesn't need to be. Agreed. Um, it's kind of like typecasting. Leonard yeah. Nimoy comes immediately to mind when he left Star Trek uh, after it ended in 1969, he was often typecast as the odd one, the alien, the stranger, the the one that was not necessarily human or whatever. And he got so fed up with it <laughs> that he wrote a book called I Am Not Spock. And it happens to a lot of people in the industry, regardless of whether or not they have a disability. And I think in our case, in, in the case of someone with a disability, um, it happens almost automatically. It, it's 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 very much a present danger, um, a pitfall. I have two things that I would love to, to do with my life going you know going into the second half of my life. I would love to be a sound designer on a, on, a, on a Star Trek show or movie or any science fiction series. I would love to get a really neat gig on an, on an animated series or movie. I think I have the talent to do both of those things without being terribly immodest. I think I, I, think I could do it. And I, but I think that it's it, both of those things are going to be a very hard road to get to, because uh, because people won't see me as this person is a great VO artist or this person is a fantastic sound designer or or mixer or producer or this per or even this person is a good VO director. I've done that for almost twenty years. It's. It's going to, as soon as we get off the virtual realm, it's going to be, oh my God, he's blind. And, and we have to overcome that. I told a group of blind students once that it is incumbent on us to be the best at what we do, not because we have to be the best because we have to be the best. It's because when a sighted person looks at you and you mess up, it isn't because you've had a bad day. Yeah. It isn't because you didn't have your morning cup of coffee <laughs> yeah. or you had an argument with your spouse or whatever that is. It's because you're blind. That's the reason that they're going to automatically assume you messed up. It even if it isn't true. It's kind of like when women were getting into the workforce, that's kind of the mentality they had to adopt also because they had to make sure they didn't mess up because otherwise it was because they were a woman. And it's that, it's that same sort of mentality that we have to work on overcoming. Yeah, and at the same time, we have to work on overcoming it, uh, that we have, to, we have to prove ourselves all the time. That is always incumbent on us. Uh, but I do think that the virtualization of the industry is pretty fantastic for people who are blind. I mean, even if we're on video, we don't really show up as blind, you know, because you, you kind of see these thumbnail images of people. You know what I mean? You don't, we, when we show up, when it's happening now that I'm noticing it is in voiceover workouts where the host wants to share their screen and they want to put the scripts up on their screen and they assume that everybody's looking at the screen and can see what they're presenting. And in Zoom, screen readers can't see the screen share. Hmm. Now that's a very interesting point. The classes that I'm teaching are inclusive of blind and sighted talents. And the barrier to make Zoom accessible 
is literally taking me to your point, Chris, earlier. It takes moments. It's not identifying buttons yeah. as all. It's just me taking the time to email the script ahead of time. It's such an easy barrier. It's an easy barrier, but it's a barrier that means that we have to, we have to announce. We have to say it. I, if, it. I mean, I recognize that your classes are, but what I'm saying is that if I go into some other workout and somebody wants to put stuff on, I have to say it. Yeah, I either have to say it in the workout out loud publicly, or I have to email the workout person beforehand and say, I'm going to show up. Here's what I need. So it makes it, it makes it so I have to announce. And where I think this also comes into play is with uh, products like Source Connect. You know, there was a sort of time back in the day where, you know, to read to picture was a thing, and you would just... You, you, you'd be reading the words, but you would be watching the screen, you know, when, when people used to go into studios. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you, you know what I'm talking about, Roy? I do. Uh, you're talk- and, and, and it still obtains when, when we're talking about ADR. Yes. Um, and, and when we're talking about foreign language dubbing, um, yes. uh, anime comes immediately to mind. Um, they, they want us, they want voiceover artists to kind of attempt to mimic the, the, uh, or go along with the, the movements of the mouth of the animated character that's already been drawn. The nice thing about when I was in Handy Manny was, of course, none of that had been drawn yet. So they were able to just animate the, the kid to match me. And, you know, when you're, unfortunately, when you're facing something that has already been filmed or already been animated, you're now having to deal with, <laughs> with what you have. Yeah, I was talking more about having to read text off of a screen rather than having it um, provided to you. So, like, you know, Source Connect is is setting it up so that the studio that's doing the recording can just project the script on the screen and it shows up to you on your side. So nobody has to send you a script in advance. They can just they can just put it up on the screen right there within the software. Just the fact of having to announce, <laughs> you know, the alternative yes. to that. It's like, that is othering. There is a intersectionality here. I'm thinking about the conversations I've had in my life where someone says, Roy, you're gay. Oh, I know a gay. I should set you up. That kind oh, of Oh, God, yes. Right. Chris, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it's that othering. It's that, oh, this is, you know, back to the dance analogy or the key to the car that these are the the barriers that that, uh, that sighted people don't have, and it's that that awareness that that needs to be built up. And it um, to your point earlier, Chris, I know it's it's not just as simple as labeling a few buttons, but in the majority of cases, as I think you and Satana have suggested, these are not you know obviously let's build the software so that it is inclusive from the beginning. And in addition to that, as as allies, we need to know that this isn't like a, a three-year project where you have to invest tens of millions of dollars and do like it's it's not a huge barrier. No, it's not. And and it's a day or two of work at most, uh, for most for most applications. And there's a mobile app that's a, a sort of a pocket recording studio, and they they literally spent like three or four hours and they had it fixed completely. It was completely accessible at that point. So, I mean, (laughs) get with it guys. (laughs) I do think accessibility is a journey and it is not um, something that you do once and it's over. And I think that these days, well, look at Netflix. If you want to turn on audio description on the Netflix mobile app, if for some reason You've downloaded an episode and it has tossed you back into English original. You have to go into audio and subtitle options. So we're lumped in with sort of the translation, transcription kinds of spaces. So I was working with someone the other day and they said, yeah, well, just like we can't ignore the blindness community, we can't ignore people who are using our app, who, you know, who are using it in other languages, and so I think that there's all of this stuff that companies have to do that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they had to do less of. There are more communities asking for features and demanding to be included. And so I think to a certain extent, it gets watered down somewhat. And the game keeps changing. 
you know, Apple upgrades something and the whole thing blows apart and they've got to fix it. Who do they who do they fix it for first? Where do the priorities go? I understand why it's difficult. So there aren't always barriers that the developers can necessarily control. But without an awareness to begin with, then all we're doing is playing catch up, keep up. Yeah. Although I will say it is better nowadays. We're not an afterthought anymore. We're kind of just included in the package of other things that have to be done. I I, I want to cite like localization companies um, in audio description that do audio description along with foreign language dubbing, you know, for their services. You know, they'll they have a, they have to turn in a package to Netflix or Amazon Prime or somebody, and it contains not only the English but the Spanish and the Japanese and the Mandarin and the French and the German and the audio description, and we're just we're now a part of that. And some people would say that we're that we're lumped in, and I think that's true. But I I think personally, I'm I'm happier to be lumped in with the other people that want inclusion than to be, so, it's like, oh, we did the captioning and we did the German and we did the, what was that other thing we had to, oh yeah, the damn description. Oh, we forgot again. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm glad we're not yeah. there. And I'm not saying that lumped in is bad. I'm just saying that because there are so many groups that are being rolled into it, the prioritization of it is not always us at the top. When I, when I go back and I look at Source Connect, they jump out at me because I, I know that, you know, right now, because everything has been virtualized, right, we're all doing these Zoom meetings and everything, everybody's using Source Connect, and their business is just booming. On their page, they talk about, you know, our support team is... Uh, they don't say overworked. There's, <laughs> but they're they they expect longer than normal response times because there's just so much going on for them right now. So now what's happened is everybody's jumping on to the Source Connect bandwagon. The resources that they have to create access are significantly less than what they had two years ago. And so when they didn't do it two years ago, when they had the opportunity, when it was quieter, they missed it. And now, for us to get a foot in the door, in my view, is harder. They didn't. They didn't do what Zoom did. Um, Zoom got in. You know, they people were already starting to talk to Zoom about making things accessible before the COVID epidemic hit. Yes. And they started to make changes to their platform before. You know, in 2019. <laughs> so, so when this came about, it was like, oh my God, there's already an accessible platform. Look at that. And now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we have to deal with these people that lag behind. It's hard to get traction from like blindness advocacy organizations with software that is so industry specific. You know, Zoom is big. Everybody uses Zoom. There's only a tiny subset of people that are using Source Connect. And I would argue there's even a tinier subset of those people who are blind and using Source Connect. But here's the thing that I firmly believe. If you create accessibility for one group, you ultimately open doors for other groups that you don't necessarily see when you create it. And my example of that is, you know, the, the quote unquote wheelchair ramp that, you know, initially people in wheelchairs were the ones that fought for them. And now you see people pushing their babies in strollers and their grocery carts and pulling their wheelie suitcases along. And they they um, are valuable for a broader population than the one for whom they were originally intended. So I argue that when you create keyboard shortcuts and you label buttons and you create a more navigationally, structurally sound piece of technology, you make it better for everybody. Agreed. Just think about keyboard shortcuts for a second. Um, I will tell you that before I got involved with Flow Tools and using Flow Tools uh, in my daily routines, I would have to go and hit equals and then type in the time code. If I, and that was only that was the general code. But if I couldn't, I would have to go up to a, a certain point on the screen and click the out time code if I wanted to do the out time code on a, on a piece of description, if I wanted to have sort of in and out time code specifically set. Now, with Flow Tools, I just hit Command F2 twice and there i am boom right there and that has already improved my timing and my efficiency yeah. and i got a sighted person 
who uses Pro Tools to learn to do that very thing. And now they're enjoying having that option available to them. They're enjoying not having to go and go back to another window and click something that they didn't necessarily need to click. And, and the neat thing about it is too, you can do it while your while your primary window is uh, an audio suite with a plugin in it. So, so you don't have to get out of a window to go do it. Now you can just hit, click the little, uh, you know, do the keyboard command and bang, you're, you know, you're good. <laughs> and that's huge. That's huge. Um, it's a, it's a remarkably big time saver. It seems so little, but keyboard commands can improve efficiency for sighted people too. To ask a, a final question, if uh, there's anything else you'd like to share, but uh, if we could go back to a point earlier about audio description and the localization, in other words, how audio description is, you know, lumped <laughs> together, as we said, to uh, to the different languages with dubbing, with uh, closed captioning. One of the things that has always struck me about audio description is that, in a sense, it is an adaptation. It's a, it's basically an adaptation of a completely new script based on source material in the same way that a, a Stephen King novel is adapted into a film. <laughs> Ironically, that Stephen King novel should be adapted into an audio description script, which is read by a blind person. But that's just, a, that's just another nuance that that kind of false comparison of a transcription or a translation versus a, a wholly created uh, script that's used to bring the visuals to life for our audiences. It's, um, you know, that, that takes, I think, a, a level of creativity and art that, you know, that both of you are involved with. And a lot of time. And a lot of time. Yeah. Which usually is ironically the very time when there is no time left. <laughs> it's, the, it's that uh, wait and hurry up effect. Hey, Chris, uh, I'd love to wrap up with any final thoughts that you'd like to share. Anything else? And then I'll ask Satana. I would say to the to the blind listeners, if you are interested in being a voiceover artist or a an audio engineer or somebody in the post-production field or whatever, or if you're just interested in doing quality control for, for audio description or or whatever, whatever the career is that you're interested in, I would say make friends with sighted allies and don't give up. Just keep pushing. I know, believe me, I know. I've been doing this this sort of thing for almost 20 years now and I understand how difficult it is to sometimes persevere and sometimes you just feel like throwing in the towel and, and just giving up, but don't. You have as much right to be out there and doing this work as anybody else. And, and if, if some sighted gatekeeper tells you differently, they don't know what they're talking about. And to the sighted listeners, I would ask you, now that you've heard several instances in this podcast of very competent, very talented, very creative, blind people in whatever roles they wish to occupy or do occupy, advocate and help us get our foot in the door and, and, you know, do what you can to, to promote the idea that, that we have something valuable to contribute uh, to whatever the field is that we're, we're talking about. Roy is a perfect example of somebody who, who gets that and is, is doing their best to provide a, a space for us to, to self-advocate and, and I think that's that's very valuable. My final thoughts for the blind listener would be know your skills. What do you need to work on? You can read copy, read copy, read copy all day as a voice actor. If you do not know how to run a digital audio workstation and edit up your own auditions and edit up, you know, a short one to three minute script, you've got a problem. Uh, because so much of this work is done from your own space. So you need to have your own space. The people who fell apart in the pandemic were the people who did not have their own spaces. So your own home studio is a valuable, valuable thing. And that means you're going to spend money because <laughs> it's not going to just happen. It is a business. Treat it like a business. It's so much fun to read the copy. It's the greatest part of it. But you have to know the technological side of it as well. And you have to be flexible 
Because one day, uh, Skype is a terrible example in 2020, but, you know, one day Skype works and the next day it blows up. And these things happen. You know, they just do. Some like, Windows updates or JAWS updates or, uh, you know, something happens and suddenly <laughs> you load up your computer and the world doesn't work the way you thought it did. Uh, so that flexibility is key. That troubleshooting ability is key. Uh, that technological side of it is key, and understanding that what you're doing as a business is incredibly valuable. And nobody should be hiring you just because you're blind. You still have to have the talent and the skill set to do the work, and to do it in a timely fashion. This is a fast-moving, fast-paced industry that we're in. And ask for help. I think sometimes, maybe less so for people that have lost their sight at some point in their life, but for those of us who grew up blind... That independence word is a word that we hear over and over. We hear it from the, the teachers who are trying to teach us how to live in, in this sighted world. You need to be independent. And we hear it from sighted people who are so amazed that we're so independent and isn't it great and how we've overcome and we're independent. Uh, and sometimes that can mean that we think asking for help is, a, is a, not the thing to do. But Man, particularly because this is a business, no business runs on its own. It, you get big enough at some point where you simply can't. You have to figure out tools and processes and find the people to work with that can be on your team and give you the help you need, whatever that help is. So do that. Okay, for sighted people, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, for sighted people, remember that... Um, Blind is a is a broad term. There's blind, there's visually impaired, there's legally blind, there's visually challenged and sight impaired and sight loss. And, oh, boy, sight loss is the big one that everybody hears and that we hear the most, I think. Um, my point with this is I'm a Braille user. I love my Braille. It works for me. But it's not the only way to read a voiceover script. And Pro Tools isn't the only way to have an accessible piece of software. And I'm not, I'm not uh, knocking Pro Tools over the head. They do a great job. I'm just saying that there are people who use large print. There are people who use Reaper. Uh, there are SoundForge and Logic users. And can they do the job? Ultimately, that's the thing. And that hopefully the person you're talking to is going to know what works for them why it works for them, and what the best things that you can do to assist them are. And uh, if you're confused, ask. Um, because there's no better way to find out. It, isn't that like on Sesame Street, Elmo, so something like if, if you're... Who says that? If you're lost, asking questions is a great way to find things out. It's really true. It's really true. And while some days I'm just so tired of being the educator, uh, we don't live in a world where that isn't the case yet. So I, I, I have to be the educator whether I want to or not in a lot of cases. So ask, because that's just the best way you're going to get the information that you need. Can't tell you how many times I heard it'll look good on your resume. Oh yeah. Um, I'll, I'll share. I'll, I'll just, I'll give you this. I just discovered that I have partially achieved my dream. I have done sound design for Star Trek. Um, I discovered this quite by accident. I was watching the new series, Lower Decks, and they have clearly downloaded the Star Trek sound effects repository to which I contributed the sound of some of the sound effects that I've collected and some custom ones that I designed for fan fiction audio dramas of Star Trek. And some of my custom sound effects are being used in that show. Literally the ones that I made that I thought, oh, this is what I need for this particular audio drama. I'm going to do this. They're using them. So... So, um, <laughs> am I, am I getting credited for that? No. Am I getting paid for that? No. And I don't expect to be, but it's just proof that, that we can do it. <laughs> Even passively, we can do it. <laughs> if you both would share the way to contact you either on social media or website or what have you, 
if our audience has heard this podcast, could they contact you in any way just to say, hey, I heard the podcast. Thank you. And maybe share some thoughts. Is there a way to, to reach both of you? Sure. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, just type in my name. Satana is a weird name. S-A-T-A-U-N-A. I guarantee you, if you type it into Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, you'll find it. You can also find my website at satana.com um, or email me at info at satana.com. I'm, I'm everywhere. Your Google search engine will show. <laughs> Unfortunately, my name is all too common. Um, uh, but you can find me on Twitter at Renfro, R E N F R O 9 2 W. It's kind of an odd thing, but, but there it is. Or you can email me at Chris, C H R A S, at Chris Dash Snyder, S N Y D E R dot com. Either of those will get my attention. I love that we've got the spectrum of access for finding you, you, you both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for everything that you've shared and the the stories that you gave and the uh, the things that we can do, both as sighted and blind talents, as well as advocates. Really appreciate both of your time. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for putting this on, Roy. This was great.